up, everybody, and welcome to Lights, Camera, Exploitation, your guide to exploitive cinema. This is the pod boss, TJ Bowser, and joining me as always is my doppelganger, Kanga Banga, from Down Under, Mr. Brody Kane. Hattie Hattie, mother lickers. And the second man on the grassy knoll, Mr. Slick Nick. What up, you exploitative bitches? We are back with another episode of your favorite podcast. This is actually the second time we're recording because the first time it fucked up. So uh, thank you for waiting. And Brody, how goes it? Look, I always fucking say, mate, it all fucking goes. Working, working, working flat out as always. Um, Yeah, I was actually lucky enough to watch Malignant last night with Mr. Bowser. Been hanging out for that one for fucking ages. And yeah, finally got to witness that. Yeah, I'm not going to go... too much into detail about that film because I reckon we might have to review that one. We're calling it um, Wonderfully Mediocre. <laughs> yes. I like it. I like it indeed. I still have mixed reviews, uh, mixed feelings about it. Um, I ain't going to lie, but yeah, elaborate on that a little bit more for that Stay episode. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come back later. Come Coming at you. Um, yeah, other than that, not much else really. Just ordering a shit ton of Blu-rays. Um, I think, was it? 88 Films uh, sent me Cyborg, ah. uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and uh, another Jean-Claude Van Damme film called In Hell, which is highly, highly underrated. Didn't uh, Red I Scorpion s- just drop from Vestron? I think it did. I think I did see that recently. Uh, was it Dawn of the Discs? Might have fucking posted yeah, something about that. speaking of Region A stuff. Ooh, Ooh. yes. <laughs> I forgot to fucking mention. Mr. Bowser has shipped me a nice little uh, package. Um, full of fucking goodies. We have a Region B box set of Hellraiser 1, Ooh. 2, and 3. Oh, So I'm looking forward to getting that bad boy. I'm having a bit of a Clive Barker fucking, um, what would you like to call it, Mr. Bowser? Epiphany? It, pretty much, pretty much. Um, I've just been loving his content lately. I think I'm starting to really, really appreciate his work. And Barker's becoming just, Argento. What Argento is to me. Pretty much. Yeah. I love the fact that uh, he can not only create great films, but he's he's just such an artist and listening to him speak outside of uh, filmmaking on various different things in society is fucking fantastic. I could listen to him all day, every day of the goddamn week. Um, yeah, also uh, Return of the Living Dead 3 from, is it Vestron? Yes. Yes, and... Holy shit, I forgot what the other one uh, was. Wes Anderson's first film from Criterion, Bottle Rocket. That's right. That's oh, right. you got Bottle Rocket? Hell yeah. Somehow, so, I when I ordered my Criterion films, I got a Region B Bottle Rocket. I didn't know they even made <laughs> Region B Criterions, and then that happened, and I put it in my player, and I was very upset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Well, what do you mean? You don't have a Region B PS2 just like sitting there like everyone else? (laughs) The one time you are actually envious of me for having a fucking Region B (laughs) Blu-ray. At least it gets to be used now. That's right. I also lashed out, bought a Region A Blu-ray player. So TJ's also Ah. a bad boy. Mm -hmm. Um, Because me being the dumb fuck that I am, bought a couple of Scream Factory um, (laughs) Blu-rays that are obviously Region A. (laughs) And, and uh, <laughs> mate, one of them is what we're going to be doing for season three. Mm-hmm. So I needed that. Um, but now I have no excuse to fucking review the films that we want to do. Um, oh, and then TJ also threw in numerous shirts. Um, other than that, how have you been, Sir Nick? I have not been bad. Um, working a lot, too. I haven't really gotten a chance to watch many new movies that have just come out, though. And I was talking to TJ about this one. I did finally actually see uh, Road to Perdition with Tom Hanks for the first time oh. absolutely oh. ever. Yeah. The massive fan of, of mafia and mob movies that I am. And I didn't see the one that has Tom fucking Hanks as the <laughs> main actor in it. I, I saw a plot synopsis like last weekend or something. I was like, that's a fuck. That's a fucking mob movie. Uh, Tom. Hay- oh, my God. And so I ended up watching it. That one is extremely good. That movie is really, really good. And I'm really sad that it took me like 18 fucking years <laughs> to see it. Um, but yeah, that one was really good. Uh, other than that, mostly just honestly shows. Um, I've just been watching a lot of Boardwalk Empire uh, lately because that was also a show I kind of missed out on. And Steve Buscemi is uh, he is love. He is life. Um, so. <laughs> 
Yeah, oh, man, it's so good. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, other than that, just doing Beetle Bros uh, with the guys and then really just kind of playing some games, um, mostly Fallout. I got back on a Fallout kick and I kind of rebought the old 90s games because uh, I used to have them like 10 or so years ago or something. I, I had them on like a CD that I bought at Best Buy as a little kid. So I got to play the old, the first two Fallout games when three came out and got really popular. Uh, that CD is long, long, long gone by now. You said so you I ended up rebuying the first two Fallout games? Yeah. Yeah, I love the Wasteland. Oh, they're fantastic. <laughs> Wasteland is also fantastic as well. Um, I haven't gotten into the new one, Wasteland 3, I think that's still isometric like the old Wasteland and Fallout games but it's just all new graphic. I haven't really gotten a chance to play that one yet because I haven't picked it up um, but I it, it all just started because I wanted to replay Fallout New Vegas because of the, our trip when we went yeah. we went to yeah. Vegas and the Mojave and all that. So like I just kind of want to replay the game. Did that, ended up beating the game and all the DLC in like a week because I have no self-control. So I ended up rebuying that and that's basically mostly what I've been up to lately anyway. Uh, DJ, what you been doing? What? Well, I've been doing a lot of podcasts, and I ordered some movies today from Unearth Films. I ordered Evil Dead Trap, a low-budget J-horror film from the 80s, I believe. And I also ordered Francesca. I have can't even remember how much I've picked up since last time. I know I've picked up some 4K Hitchcock films, and those look absolutely Ooh. exquisite. I watched Psycho 2 and 3 recently, and those films are delightful. Watch Malignant yeah. with Brody. Brody and I have been playing uh, Phasmophobia in an inordinate amount. I will absolutely play some spooky game with you guys <laughs> at some point. I love that fucking game so much. I have way too many hours in it. Brody's almost level 100 and I'm almost level 50. So we're, we're getting there. Anyway, let's talk about film, boys. More importantly, <laughs> let's talk about Black Christmas from 1974. Also known as Silent Night, Evil Night or Stranger in the House. Silent Night, Evil Night. by Bob Clark, who also did Porky's in 1981, Porky's 2 the next day in 1983, A Christmas Story in 1983, Baby Geniuses in 1999, writers Roy Moore, who also did She Cried Murder in 1973, a TV movie, The ABC Afternoon Play Break, 1974, The Adventures of Timothy Pilgrim from 1975, The Last Chase in 1981, cinematographer Reginald H. Morris, who also did King of the Grizzlies in 1970, Porky's in 1981, A Christmas Story in 1983, You'll Shut Your Eye Out, and Loose Cannons in 1990. Music by Carl Zitterer. I said that right. Children Shouldn't Play With yes. Dead Things in 1972. Good film, Deranged Confessions of a Necrophile from 1974. Fucked up film, Prom Night 1980. Oh. Prom Night! And Ghost Forest in 2013. Special effects, Warren Keeler, who also did The Neptune Factor in 1973, The Cloud Murders in 1976, Prom Night 1980, and Jason X in 2001. Producers, Bob Clark, costume designer Debbie Weldon, who did Sea of Love in 1989, Mr. Magoo in 1997, Deep Rising in 1998, and Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. We have a budget of $625,000. Starring Margot Kidder as Barb. You may know her from Superman in 1978, The Amityville Horror in 1979, Captain Planet and the Planeteers from 1993 till 1996. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet as the voice of Gaia and Halloween 2 from 2009. Olivia Hussey as Jess, who started Romeo and Juliet in 1968, Lost Horizon in 1973, Death on the Nile in 1978, and Ice Cream Man in 1995 with Clint Howard. I guess she also heard Wanna Lick in that. Uh, 
Kirdula as Peter, who also started 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968. Welcome to Blood City in 1977. 2010's The Year We Make Contact in 1984. And Space Station 76 in 2014. John Saxon is Lieutenant Ken Fuller, who is in The Evil Eye 1963, which is a Mario Bava film. Tenebre in 1982 from The Italian Autoire. Dario Argento. A Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984, and Hellmaster in 1992. Oh, that film. Marion Waldman as Mrs. Mack, who's an alcoholic, who also starred in The Star Lost in 1973, Class of 44 in 1973, A Cosmic Christmas in 1977, which was a TV movie, and Phobia in 1980. Andrea Martin as Phil, who starred in Cannibal Girls in 1973, Interspace in 1982, and Rugrats from 1992 to 2002 as the voice of Aunt Miriam. And she was in the remake of Black Christmas, in 2006. James Edmund as Mr. Harrison, who starred in Devil Girl from Mars in 1954, The Boy in Blue in 1986, Not My Department in 1987, and Breaking All the Rules in 1988, a TV movie. And lastly, but not leastly, baby, Doug McGrath as Sergeant Nash, who starred in Bronco Billy in 1980, Pale Rider in 1985, The Rocketeer in 1991, and Ghost of Mars in 2001. Brody, take it away! LH Town of Bedford is receiving an unwelcome guest this Christmas as the residents of Sorority House Pi Kappa Sigma prepare for the festive season. The stranger begins to stalk the house. A series of obscene phone calls start to plague the residents of the sorority, and it becomes clear that a psychopath is homing in on the sisters with dubious intentions. And though the police try to trace the calls, they discover that nothing as is as it seems during this black Christmas. Awards! Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films of the United States of America in 1976. Best Horror Film nominee at Canadian Film Awards in 1975. Best Sound Editing, Kenneth Healy Ray, Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner. Best Editing, Stan Cole, Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner. Edgar Allan Poe Awards in 1976. Best Motion Picture nominee. Boys, it's been a while, but let's get physical. Okay, so we got a tasty release from Shout Factory that dropped on December 13th, 2016, rated R. And it features a 2016 2K scan of the negative, a DTS HD Master 5.1, Audio commentary with Bob Clark. Audio commentary with John Saxon and Kier Dula. Audio commentary with Nick Mancusa, who is in character as Billy the whole time. And it's fucking funny! <laughs> Audio interview with director Bob Clark. 2006 Critical Mass HD Master. New film in Furs, remembering Black Christmas with Art Hindle. New f- Victims and Virgins, remembering Black Christmas with Lynn Griffin. Black Christmas Legacy, 40th anniversary panel at Fan Expo 2014, featuring John Saxon, Art Hindle, Lynn Griffin, and Nick Mancusa, which I believe Brody watched in its entirety. Yes, yes, I did. On screen, Black Christmas featurette, 12 days of Black Christmas featurette, Black Christmas revisited featurette, archival interviews with Olivia Hussey, Art Hindle, Margot Kidder, Bob Clark, and John Saxon. Midnight screening QA with Bob Clark, John Saxon, and Carl Zitterer. Two scenes with the new vocal soundtrack, original theatrical trailers English and French (laughs) original TV and radio spots alternate title sequences still gallery (laughs) suck them still gallery (laughs) currently on Shout Factory for $19.99 or Amazon for $17.99 additional information when asked in an interview with the Black Christmas archival interviews that can be seen on YouTube Olivia Hussey was asked if she had found the phone calls offensive to her reply No, because when I had taken the phone calls, the voice they put in afterwards wasn't the voice that I was hearing. (laughs) That was added during the looping. And so I didn't really hear the really horrible things that were being said. I heard Bob Clark reading back to me things like, I'm going to get you. So I had to react and be terrified. But when you see the film, you see those things are incredibly horrible. They were not in the script. But Bob Clark improvised them and then added them in afterwards. So it doesn't matter what's being said, really. You just commit to the role and go with the flow. Boom! That's how you do things. What? (laughs) A little bit of some uh, real world effect on the movie here. So Black Christmas was originally set to premiere on primetime TV on NBC late January of 1978, using that original alternate title of Stranger in the House. However, shortly before the scheduled release, there was a series of attacks on students at Florida State University 
adversity that caused it to get pushed back initially slightly, uh, though it ended up being pushed all the way back to May 14th of that year because it ended up Ted Bundy <laughs> is responsible for getting this movie pushed back like half a year. The ass biter himself, Zach Efron. I mean, Ted Bundy. Yep. <laughs> Son of a bitch, Zac Efron. I mean, Ted. <laughs> He's got his Netflix documentary. Hasn't he taken <laughs> enough? <laughs> we have Olivia Hussey talking about the script. She ripped fuck. <laughs> fuck that up. <laughs> right. Let me fucking backtrack. Olivia Hussey talks about the script. I thought it was fantastic. I said, oh, my God, this is so frightening. Bob wanted to do alternate endings, and we didn't know if I was going to be killed or leave it open at the end. So in one of the versions that were going to kill me, he said it's better that we leave her in the house with the phone ringing. And he was correct in doing so that because that ending creepy. is so much better. Mm -hmm. It's so much better. <laughs> so uh, comedian Steve Martin, uh -huh. you may have heard of him, huh? <laughs> is a huge fan of the film. Uh, when he and actor Olivia Hussey actually met for the first time when they were both auditioning for their roles in the 1987 movie Roxanne, <laughs> Marvin told Hussey... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Marvin reportedly told Hussey, oh my God, Olivia, you were in one of my favorite all-time films, which she believed to be 1968's <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and whenever she had told that, he went, no, it's Black Christmas, stating that he had seen the film at least 27 times. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Weirdo. His career will never go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just for some reason, I was just thinking of that most is like bit in The Simpsons where he tries to do stand up comedy and he's like, oh, yeah. Hi, my name is Mo, or as the ladies like to call me, hey, you there behind the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> So, Olivia Hussey talking about the killer's identity. Even at the end, I believe you never really know who it is. I think with today's films, they show too much. And that is true. Uh, with Hitchcock, he showcased that you don't really need to see everything. But you have the idea that you've seen something like the thought of some man standing behind a door, peering at you, what to me is a lot more frightening. Throughout the film, when we supposedly saw the killer, it was a different person each time, like a double. It wasn't a particular person. I think one time Bob even played it, and then another time someone else. I like that she kind of brought up uh, about Hitchcock at that point, too, with his whole famous, uh, not so much speech, but his famous example of, of you have the two guys talking at a table, and you pan the camera back and forth. There's no tension, nothing like that. There's just two guys talking at a table. You pan the camera back out and reveal there's a bomb underneath it. Neither of the characters know, but you know, and it just increases the tension over and over. I, I love that she kind of brought him up for that one because every time I just I think about him doing that explanation where he's like, and suddenly there's a bomb. Now there's tension, even though the characters have no clue. You do because I love Hitchcock, at least his filmmaking. <laughs> he was a man. He was the man. I think he was. Him. Yeah. No, he was oh, fantastic at that. Virtuoso. Anyways. <laughs> so the film, uh, aside from Steve Martin, is also said to be the favorite horror movie of Elvis Presley as well. Oh. That. <laughs> uh, and that after its release, uh, he apparently attempted to start a tradition where he would watch the film every Christmas. Though, uh, if this is true, it would mean that he was only able to follow said tradition three times before he did finally pass away in 1977, although it is said that the, F the Presley family has kept the tradition alive in his absence. Um, I think that was from an article I saw a few years ago. I wonder if they're if, still uh, doing it now. Elvis voice Billy, voice Billy. Come on, baby. Oh, my God. Billy wants a lick. <laughs> <laughs> if you like Johnny Bravo, fucking... It's it fucking oh, so much. Hello, hello, baby. <laughs> hello, baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> Where's the part in the movie where the little girl comes in and like smacks him in the face? I was like, Johnny, let's go. Hello, baby. Can you show me them titties? I found some crystal. I found some crystal figurines in your bedroom. Let's go. Oh, fuck it up. Shit. So. Director Bob Clark talks about the film. It was my third horror film. 
it was easy for me to get independent finances, but I had every intention of treating this one differently than other horror films. Like there hadn't been many teen exploitation films that had happened yet. But I intended to have my actors act like real human beings and to have these college kids act the way college kids are. So I thought it was a great classic horror story and I had hoped to break new ground by the attitude and treatment of the actors in the reality of their world and thirdly to bring in some new cinematic ideas. It's an interesting film because I've hit classic on one level and cult on the other level but I had hoped for that especially a film that was shot in the 70s. That's pretty hopeful. Um, so anyway uh, the the actual impetus for the change in title um, upon its initial release in the United States uh, to Silent Night Evil Night um, was because the distributors believed that the film would not sell well under the name Black Christmas due to being mistaken for a black exploitation film at the time. Uh, <laughs> which this, I guess this is around the time that we Shaft the just came it. out. <laughs> yeah. Like, Shaft had just come out. All of that was just kind of starting to really pick up steam. Um, I mean, if you really want to get into that, you can check out the, the uh, brown sugar um, package for Prime Video. If you really want to get into those and start watching them, that's actually not bad. That's how Shaft I watch Shaft. Shaft goes to Africa. Shaft goes to Africa. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's all you need. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the name ended up being reverted back to its original title after they uh, chickened out, went with Silent Night, Evil Night, and it failed to pick up any real traction using that new name. Went back to Black Christmas, and now we have the cult film that we do today. Bingo! I was say, it's one that my co-worker has remembered as the scariest movie she's ever watched for the past 50 years. So, <laughs> goddamn right. Hell yeah. Bob Clark talks about the acting throughout the film. He quotes, I was surprised at how good the acting was, and I remember doing a magazine interview a few years later saying that the acting was very mature for this film. It was played very low key and close to the vest. In particular scenes, it was successful for me, and I think the very famous carol scene, where it is intercutting with the children and the singing of the Christmas carols with the murder of Margot Kidder. I was impressed that I kept to my motto of not being too graphic. And that, I mean, we'll get to it later, but I have my feelings about that scene. <laughs> uh, as I do with this one. Uh, so as previously stated, for the phone dialogue scenes, uh, Nick Mancuso's voice as Billy was added in post-production uh, with director Bob Clark reading rather relatively tame dialogue out loud while the actors would react to the lines. Uh, now, they, I will get into this one later whenever we get into the actual impact but i i have to talk about this part because it does i can't see this scene and know that info without thinking of clerks with randall reading the names of the adult films being ordered into the store in front of a mom with a kid <laughs> on her hip <laughs> as jeff anderson was just like no no i'm not gonna say that in front of her like that. <laughs> i'm just not gonna read these because, like, they get, like, South Park trying to get themselves canceled level bad with the stuff that they make him read. Uh, so it does kind of it is a little bit understandable, uh, though it would have been so much funnier if he actually did. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so but other than that, like we said, Mancuso would come back and reprise that role and get all the credit that he rightfully deserves for doing the audio commentary on the 40th anniversary Blu-ray release of the film. Very nice indeed. He deserves it. <laughs> Absolutely. So we got Bob Clark talking about him not showing the killer throughout the film. From the beginning, I wanted to see if I could get away without showing a killer. I don't think it had been done before. But he had these phone calls that allowed us to conjure up scares. But without that device, we would not have been able to avoid a killer. So I determined from the beginning that he would be the camera and all we would be allowed to see is his hands. Part of a body or the reaction to what he sees. So yes, I had always planned it that we would not see Billy, and he would only be this presence. And he was also right for doing that. <laughs> Bob Clark just did everything right. <laughs> so, uh, though actor Olivia Hussey did gain her initial recognition as a scream queen, uh, Black Christmas did help to launch her career, uh, and it did kind of get, gain her that cult status. Um, though, in contrast to that, she actually does not like horror films at all. Uh, she just kind of claims that they scare her too much, Hussey. and that she had originally accepted the role as Jess in the film based entirely on the advice of a psychic she went to. 
who told her that the film would lead to great success. So, you know, broken clock is right twi- twice a day, I guess. You know, so <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> Boys, favorite performance of the film. Slick Nick. Take it away. Sweet escape. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so mine is probably going to have to be kind of a, a, a close two, really. Um, so I know your boys' opinion, um, and he is one of my favorites. Big boy Billy here uh, does give off one of the best performances of a slasher villain uh, that has just ever existed. Um, you mean however, I mean, yeah. And and still it remains. That's the thing. There's been how many slashers since, and it still remains one of the best. I, I mean, it's 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 got to be up there. But for my personal favorite performance, I am gonna have to go with Margot Kidder for this one, considering this was early enough. Uh, this was one of her first ever uh, horror acts, and she did just kind of go on to be fucking Lois Lane in the Superman movie. So she didn't really do a whole bunch of it, but. With the fact that she was also reportedly genuinely inebriated for every single scene in which Barb is supposed to be drunk. Fantastic. Because she because she insisted on it to Bob Clark. It was just like, no, 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 no. If I'm going to act drunk, you're going to have to get me drunk. And then she just did and still was able to just properly play this hilarious ass character throughout it and be the very well needed comic relief for a movie that is very, very dark. <laughs> uh, and for the first black, even. <laughs> uh, she, I mean, it's it's just it's fantastic. Like, it's just good. And then I guess. If I had to give a uh, an honorable mention, we're going to have to go with Mrs. Mack because good God, she, she cracks me up so hard, especially when the father starts coming through looking for his kid and she already doesn't like him because he's very Puritan and everything. And they've all just been getting drunk and swearing like sailors the whole time. And she's doing the like jack off hand signal every like whenever he walks off of the screen and all that while they're investigating actual murders happening in the house. And she's drunk, carving it out of a Bible. She's like, oh, man, I don't care. I really, it's just hilarious. So I, I got to give an honorable mention to Mrs. Mac, but I'm going to have to go with Margot Kidder. Billy is a close second. Uh, what about you, Brody? What's yours? Any motherfucker throughout this film who played Billy had a hand in playing Billy, whether it was the voice, <laughs> physically yes. fucking acting. Um, yeah, this motherfucker comes to play and does not fuck around one bit. I mean, he's Iconic. truly a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> and the fact we don't even get to see who it is, it's even more intimidating. Um, and the creep factor is there. But I, I think it's really that what he does to these girls is like, it's next level. I love that shit. And I think it's portrayed extremely well throughout the film. So, yeah, like I said, to ever played Billy throughout this film, bravo, bravo. And whatever yeah. he did by the to those girls was only there amplified by the fact that he had no motive to do so. And I think that, that where they right. did the same thing with Michael Myers and at least tried to, they kind of spoiled that by giving him motive in the second film. I think more of the ruthless killer that you never see, I think that's more intimidating. I mean, it clearly set the patient genre. We'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. But... Yeah, yes. Billy is absolutely intense. He is absolutely ruthless in this film. I love how he goes from zero to 100 in an instant. I love his freakout scene. I just love everything about this character. I love the point of view shots. I love how the film opens. It's just awesome. Billy is rad. And I think that the remakes of this film completely miss the point of it. And I think that that's why they suck. We don't even want to fucking talk about the 2019 one. <laughs> like, fuck all that. But anyway, anyway. Set piece, the house, right? We are about to say, we're going to do a thing where we did on the last recording where all three of us went, man, that goddamn house. (laughs) I mean, we have to, right? Who doesn't love one setting films? For one, awesome. And the house is massive. <laughs> like, they're Psycho House, right? Yeah. This film is a whole nother monster in itself because it's just, Billy could be anywhere. And I love it. I just absolutely like, love it. I think from the films that we've watched already, the closest we can get to it is Edge of the Axe. Okay. With the hotel and Edge of the Axe. 
and just everything about it, or even hell, next of kin. Yeah, I was probably, say. yeah. I was gonna say, but they're like, <laughs> honestly, they're both pretty equivalent. But I think th- I think Black Christmas is better, just because there's basically no soundstage at all. They just rented this house. We are, and they're like, all right, we're gonna shoot a slasher in it. We are on a genre heavy bender right now to finish off this season. So yeah, it really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what can you do? You know, <laughs> I, uh, we can say that uh, season three, which will be coming to you probably as soon as next week uh has many different genre in it. Yeah. many different locations i am looking forward to one in particular that i know brody and i both like that it's got a lot of places it's got a lot of cool shit that happens <laughs> is, that, is that the folklore one no it is the one that takes place in the uk in modern times and has one mr michael smiley in it a midsummer kind of vibe to it a little bit even though it came out like i like just saw tj's face you mean wicker man <laughs> Well, both. We'll fucking say Midsummer on this show. <laughs> say, TJ's face if, to our fucking listeners. You went from happy to unhappy in a fucking instant. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I don't care. I'll fight for Midsummer. I'll fight for my boy Ari Aster. Oh, God. <laughs> if he, could only, if he yeah. could only come up with his own ideas, he'd be a good filmmaker. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anything else you guys um, want to say about set piece? <laughs> We have some it's things big. to discuss later, big boy. <laughs> the set piece is big like Bobby's penis. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Huge. Hot take. Hot Man, take. our boy. Our boy. <laughs> Got the, yeah. Right. Big Mr. Poland. Uh. <laughs> favorite oh. scene or shot? Uh, I guess favorite scene shot. I am going to have to go because I brought it up earlier. It's 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 Barb's death. It's got to be. It's the intercut between. I mean, Bob Clark said it himself. It's the intercut between the kids singing the Christmas carols and the actual like refrain of there's no real direct direct on screen violence other than you see just Billy swings of the the crystal figurines and and then just kind of Barb's face throughout it. Um, They do kind of play her up a little bit early as one of the more main characters before Jess sort of takes over. I kind of wonder if that we'll get to it later, but I kind of wonder if that helped with the sort of like final girl trope of the slasher movies. But I mean, it's I mean, it's got to be it's got to be Barb's death. Like like, as if scene wise, it's got to be Barb's death for me, not my favorite favorite death though just how it was shot i anyway uh, yeah i guess that's mine uh tj what 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 is yours what did you think okay, sir? shot i love the pov shots of billy anything billy doing that I, uh and that also kind of goes into the scene i love barb's death but i also love billy's freak out i just love how intense it is and how just cinema because it's just absolute bonkers and it's out of nowhere and i think that those scenes in this movie that stand out to me the most because it's, they're the most effective uh yeah i'd have to say those two I, I mean, Barb's death, the editing is just absolutely exquisite. I'm trying to think. Also, that, that last half when Billy finally leaves the attic and chases her, that's pretty fucking good, too. When she gets a hold of her hair. Yeah. That gets no, your it's fucking not a, it's, power. Yeah. That's suspenseful as fuck. Fuck. It's pretty good. Also, even just the scene that you were talking about with Billy losing his shit, that really gives you a proper perspective as to how deranged he is and why yeah. he does not need a motive. There is none. He's for fast. The movie. Like, that it, gets yeah. so established the moment he fucking leaves. This fucker's fast. <laughs> Seriously. A track runner. Yeah. And goddamn Olympian. <laughs> like, Michael Myers can walk around all he fucking wants. Keep Billy the fuck away from him. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> like oh god damn look at the hammies on that piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> that man never skips leg day <laughs> yeah uh, for me it would be um it'd be probably that final scene where we get the one shot of panning from bedroom to bedroom then finally to the attic where you hear billy's voice and then it cuts to the face in the window and then it pans out as to reveal the whole location exterior whatever you want to fucking call it and then as the credits roll we see this face still hauntingly fucking it's, it's just great I think it's claire's like, yep still yeah, wrapped in the plastic yeah, cool. she's still yeah. in the yeah and claire's face just yeah. um yeah just this corpse there Staring at you still. I think that is just fucking brutal. It's sinister. And the fact that Billy's still up there, like. Think about the choice to have such a violent death to start it off with that suffocating in the plastic. The suffocation? Yeah. Yeah. And then to have her on display in the attic like that? Because they can just keep cutting. But also, I mean, we can kind of fast forward here a little bit to some of our other things. Think of how that trope follows into slasher films to come where they take the bodies and store them in a location for display. Look at the mm-hmm. Sleepaway Camp films. Uh, oh, God. 
Brody, what other films where the killer goes, ah, Mutilator, where they go and stash the bodies in a different location and then we have this reveal shot of all the bodies at the end. This is kind of like a miniature version of that where you have the uh, the house mother in the attic hanging and then you also have uh, Homegirl in the chair. I mean, look how that translates into future films. Oh, yeah. Attention. Say Jason Voorhees likes to do that shit. Yeah, you see that in Freddy oh, yeah. versus Jason. And you also a see lot. it in uh, Friday 13th Part 2 uh, whenever you go into the shack. Yep. Mm-hmm. Or the... Um, doesn't he... Doesn't he freeze a body too in Jason X with like the cryogenics? He smashes it, so that doesn't. No, okay. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't remember if he left it or. It's been way too long since I've seen my favorite Jason in space movie. It's okay, so. Nick. He just wanted his machete back. Okay, he did. Uh, he really did. <laughs> I, I think Michael Myers does it in Halloween Five, doesn't he? Up in, in the attic as well. Isn't there bodies of? I'm victims pretty up sure in. The the Rob Zombie movie, at least, he does it as well because Rob Zombie got into that with uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I, I, honestly, yeah. <laughs> I honestly think Halloween 5 may have stole this from Black Christmas. Fair I wouldn't doubt sure. it. Speaking <laughs> of Halloween 5, <laughs> so, 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 yeah. sidebar, uh, since we've been gone, since we've gone, they have announced gone. the Doctor Death sequences from Halloween 5 have been found and they will be dropping. And I am yeah. excited. <clears throat> okay, back to Black Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite effect and or death, boy. It's Mrs. Mac, man. Yeah. It's got to be Mrs. Mac, man. <laughs> I did, is what I said. Favorite scene for why it's shot, Margot Kidder. Favorite death, man, you can't argue with Mrs. Mac just getting a straight up attic crane swung right into her head that just rips her whole body up through the, the like panel into the attic. And then there she stays on display next to Claire for the scene that Brody was just talking about. Billy has impeccable like, timing. It's beautiful. It's, it's also a great scene to just kind of watch him like... <laughs> start to swing it and then she moves he's like ah ah, shit wait hold on no i gotta hold on (laughs) (laughs) you see him actually kind of wait this deranged maniac with no like who's the scariest thing in a movie in a very long time (laughs) go to to swing it and then she moves her head and he stops for a second you actually see his arm kind of quit he's like oh wait well hold on well shit well god damn it now you fucked it up what oh no she's in place (laughs) and then she gets pulled up out it's it's just that right level of it's fucked it's brutal and there's that little bit so you kind of get a laugh before it too like it's just it's perfect it's a perfect horror movie death scene for me it's gotta be one of my favorites um but yeah that's gotta be mine um Brody? Yeah, no, I, I had the same scene, um, mainly for the fact, though, uh, the way it was shot from the point of view shots, uh, as we were discussing. But the, is, uh, the lighting and the sound design in that, the, it's mainly the sound design for me. I mean, it definitely creates that atmospheric, uh, in, like, just tension. It's all about that. I think you put your headphones on, crank that shit right up, and listen to the sound palette. It is fucking intimidating um, and downright haunting, especially when we hear her scream. Um, yeah, that was probably the most effective death for me throughout the film. Um, I love it. Love it. Thought it was thought it was exquisite on the palette, as some would say. What about you, Mister Bowser? I agree with uh, what Nick said. The uh, perfect timing kill to the old uh, house mother. What's her name? Mrs. Mac. Mrs. Mac. It's, it's yeah. McHenry. Yeah. The lady but I think they just call her movies. <laughs> <laughs> we all had the same. Yeah. It's no say. It's, it's really just, good. I can agree with you, Brody, for sure. Especially on the sound design, it's extremely industrial, especially like, like especially for the seventies. I did mention that that first kill was an exceptionally violent. So. Yes. yes. Oh yes. That is all. Awesome. It is a very good kill. The only thing that ever took me out even slightly was her seeing someone very obviously standing in her closet behind the like plastic. We do kind of cut back, and there's all the like little. Is there a guy there? Or is there That's not? That's half kinda, the charm, you know? I, yeah. I just feel like during that scene, they make it slightly too obvious that there is a person there. And she's like, who is that? Come here. Who Who are you? And then just walks into the closet. And I'm like, well, you're going to die, obviously. <laughs> like, I'm no, really, I'm really. no college student that I know on their own in a room but by themselves would be like, who's behind that? And then walk into the closet. Like they go, there's a fucking person in my room. And then go downstairs to the others and go, there's a fucking dude upstairs. <laughs> like that was the only thing about Claire's death. I didn't eh. it just seemed a little bit too illogical for me to really like but it is it is brutal and it is not bad at all thoughts on story I mean it birthed, it birthed a genre <laughs> it, it, it absolutely birthed a genre it's been <laughs> attempted to be replicated uh, twice and it has failed I think this film has its own place in history 
and it stands the test of time. I want a 4K release ASAP. I want Bob yes. Clark to supervise that fucking thing. Yeah, this film is fucking amazing. I love how Billy has zero motivation to do the things that he does. I love the Margot Kidder character, how she's drunk the entire time, and she kind of doesn't take it seriously until the end. I love how the dynamic of all these girls play off. I love how they treat other girls differently. So it kind of establishes that they have a history. So I think that's also portrayed well through the acting of this film. For people. Yeah. I think for for the regular people. An early 70s film, this movie fucking slaps. And it's fucking rock solid. And I highly recommend it to anybody. Fans of the slasher genre. Yeah, absolutely. I'd even even say fans of the Jello genre as well. Yeah. I I think it's sprinkled with the uh, vibes from those type of films. I, I love it. It's brutal disturbing entertaining but what i really like about it the most um is the fact that they give you these characters that you can elaborate with and actually feel for the character development in this film is fucking um fantastic especially for a 70s flick um well horror flick um but yeah um i i do honestly believe this started um the slasher genre that we have today yeah it's mm-hmm. um yeah it's real like TJ was saying about um, the, the the characters of Billy and Michael Myers, um, obviously both slashes, but this Billy here is incredibly haunting, more so than Michael. Michael does his thing, and I respect that. Um, but yeah, this this motherfucker, he is next level, and that's what mm-hmm. scares me. What he is capable of doing, I would say he's yeah, like I'd say he's I guess more than Michael Myers, considering like TJ said earlier, um, with the second movie giving him motivation that we really didn't need. I mean, I guess it doesn't it doesn't make the subsequent Halloween movies terrible, at least in my opinion, but it does detract a little bit. He reminds me more of Maniac. Like, like, okay, both of them, really. The original 80s one and even the Elijah Wood one didn't do too bad, honestly. Um, they're, they're both difficult to watch, <laughs> I would at least say. Um, mostly because of their main villain, who happens to kind of be a protagonist, I think. And the the beginning of that was the fact that they use Billy as a presence. They use him first person only. You don't see him outside as some it's a guy or anything. When he's on screen, when he's being used, you see it from his perspective or something that is just slightly off and just slightly obscure and you never quite get a look at him, which is why they had all the so devils and everything. You'd say that Black Christmas inspired Bill Lustig to write? Probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it probably, it, it. you know, I would assume it goes into the impact and takeaways that we'll get to next, so it's kind of a little bit of an answer to both of those for me, um, but yeah, yeah, honestly, I, I think it didn't just help create that genre. It helped cement some of the better tropes that over time were used less and less while they were trying to change the genre up. I mean, I'm sure it was just because they were trying to mix it up and make something new and fresh. But at certain points, it kind of feels like if, a, an, if, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. When it comes to the main villain, um, it is nice to get a motivation for a villain, especially if they actually have relatable goals, because it makes it more interesting to kind of bounce back and forth. But when you just have a villain that has no motivation, he's just there to be evil. You can make that far more interesting to watch, I think. They did here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Um, I'm going to say that's about my take on it. I least. mean, <laughs> can exploitation at its absolute finest? I mean, we've all talked about how it influenced other films of the genre and how it influenced just film in, in general. Uh, e- I mean, even Canadian film. Uh, it opened the door, I'm sure, for many up and coming Canadian filmmakers to say, hey, I can do something like that. And yeah, it's, it's rad and if you have the opportunity to watch this film, absolutely go check it out. Like we said, Scream Factory has a release of it. That's Region A. It's pretty fucking good. Uh, there's a 2006 remake, and then there's a remake from 2019. Is that correct? Yeah, it was 2019. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't recommend those, but I'll recommend this one for days. <laughs> yeah. Billy's Listen awesome. To the man. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> this film's awesome, and its legacy will live on forever, and more than just our hearts. Yeah. So you guys so are- I mean, as I mentioned, I have a coworker who saw this when it came out and was in college when it came out. And 50 years later, to this day, is like, that is still the scariest movie I've ever seen in my entire life. And she's seen the remakes. <laughs> like, she saw the 2006 one. I was like, what about that? She's like, it's awful. It's just bad. <laughs> so. Spider Billy. <sighs> Dude crawls like Tobey Maguire in those walls. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, let's rate this bad boy. Filthy obscene phone calls out of five. Brody Kane, start us off. I'm going to give it a uh, 3.9. Ooh. 
Nick. 3.75. I'm going to give it a 4.2. Ooh. That is an LCE score of 3.9. Fucking fine with that. <laughs> Out of five, filthy obscene phone calls for 1974's Black Christmas. So next season coming at you sooner than later. We got a little preview going for you. So one of the films that I chose was Tenebre from Dario Argento, continuing that streak. Brody, reveal one of your picks for next season. Go. Well, I'm going on with the streak of Ozploitation again. Well, just this film. And it's called The Masturbating Gunman. So you're in for a fucking treat. And expect a special guest for that episode. And finally, yeah. Slickless Nicholas, hit us with that third. I guess I can reveal the movie that we tried very hard to not reveal earlier because we forgot about this part. Uh, <laughs> Kill List was the movie I was referring to earlier. The folklore one. Uh, with Michael Smiley. <laughs> Fucking man. Those episodes will be coming at you very, very soon, so stay tuned to the RSS feed for those tasty new episodes available on projectlouder.net and anywhere else you consume audio-only content. Thank you for tuning in on another episode of Lights, Camera, Exploitation this is the pod boss tj bowser saying see you next season love y'all appreciate y'all bye bye this is your dkb all the way from down under saying thank you for giving us a fucking listen and we hope to see you for season three motherfuckers bye bye slick nick from the butt fuck middle of the u.s saying stay beautiful you sons of bitches hello Hello? Who is this? me chair thought in the microphone i nearly shit myself <laughs> nice <laughs> hell man clout you should have done it <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice little quiz i'll leave it just leave it in the recording and be like this is the moment <laughs>